Hi there, um, could you let me know if you can hear me please? I can see that there are a few of you here logged in already. We'll be starting um, the webinar in the next five minutes or so, but it's a great chance just now to do a sound check. So if um, you could let me know if you can hear me, I'd really appreciate it. There's a chat bar down at the side so you should be able to um you should be able to hear me and let me know if you can that is on microphone is on. So I can see people arriving from various different places. Could you let me know if you can hear me, please? I must keep talking, of course, otherwise I don't know if you can hear me. <laughs> um, so I can see people arriving from lots of different places. Oh, good. I've got a thumbs up from someone. Thank you, Julie. Um, Denise, can you hear me? Yes, oh great, Swansea, oh lovely, okay. Oh, this is always so interesting. So um, we're, we're just going to give it five minutes to let people arrive, um, because this is Ireland, so nothing will start. To, I've said eight o'clock, but nothing ever starts on time here. So um, if you could let me know where you are, there's a chat bar that you should be able to type into. And um, if you let me know where you are in the world, that's always really nice for me to hear because I can try and keep the content relevant for you. Um, we had quite a few people on from the States last night as well as Ireland and the UK. County Kildare, very good. How is the weather in County Kildare? It is rotten and clear. Hi, Anya. <laughs> um, we've had snow. I don't know. I feel really sorry for my e-course students just now because I, I've been I went to well I filmed loads of lessons last year but I want to film new ones this year and um, there, it's just so cold here oh it has it's been beautiful right well it's not beautiful here just now <laughs> uh, we had so much snow on Saturday that um, we had a snowball fight so um, great I'm getting lots of good messages about the sound that's great thank you and it's mild with you Great, great, great. It's, it's looking good for the sound, if sound can look good. Um, yeah, um, but uh, yeah, we had loads of snow and um, it doesn't snow very often in Ireland. Um, and I don't live very high up, but we had enough snow for a snowball fight. So it was very good, but um, my poor nettles got covered in snow. <laughs> Um, so anybody else from any other parts of the world? Um, that's great. And I can see some of you were here last night. We had a webinar on um, introducing making your own herbal remedies. And tonight I'm going to look at, well, some of them exactly the same plants, actually, as we looked at um, yesterday evening but talking about the more from hello hello <laughs> sorry i've got a really big hello there <laughs> um um yeah so tonight i'm going to talk about the plants more from a, a point of view of them being foods and um about their nutritional value and um, using them as wild edibles but as always, there will be a bit of a crossover um, because there, there always is between these things. So you can ask me your, your questions. Um, we'll try to, the webinar lasted about 45 minutes last night. So I will prattle on for um, probably for 35 minutes or something. And then there'll, there'll be, there should be time for questions then. And um, I could talk about herbs until midnight, but I promise not to. So um, we will make sure we're finished um, within the hour. Um, so I can see, great, there's, there's lots of good things about the sound. Um, so that's great. And I can see more and more people arriving. So I'll just give it another two minutes and then we'll start. Um, 
Yeah. Is uh, anybody, apart from there's a very obvious exception who's in here tonight, but is anybody who's here, are you doing any wild food foraging or is this new to you? If you can type into the chat bar, that would be interesting for me to know as well. Um, it's new. Yeah, great. Great stuff. It's an enormous topic. Yeah, grand. It's new. Well, it's aimed, it's aimed for people that it's new to, but it's just it's such an enormous topic. And with anything to do with plants, really, it's, um, oh, it's lifetimes of learning, really, with them. And they're fascinating. And um, there are just so many different ways that we can work, work with them. So, um, you know, I've read little else, really, other than books about herbs for the last... Um, Mm, 18 years really I suppose possibly longer so um and they just never fail to fascinate me it's just such a wonderful area to um be interested in and th there's just so many different ways you can learn to work with them it's just completely and utterly fascinating and absorbing and um a massive, massive hobby or or lifestyle in in um in my case and in the case of other people I know that are here this evening too. So I think I will click the button and start the recording. Um, if you if you want to, oh very good. Somebody's been doing some foraging berries and mushrooms. Do you know I don't do mushroom foraging? Great, loud and clear. Thank you. I don't do mushroom foraging at all, and um, that is, um, I, there's there's a specialist in Ireland that I, I usually send people to, and there are there are lots of other ones in the UK as well. If you're if you're in the UK, but um, I have to say that is the next area I really want to learn about. So um, it's just been beyond what I've been able to have time to to um, learn about. But I definitely want to learn about them they're 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 really interesting in terms of keeping weeds down as well um, um encouraging fungi to grow seems to be a really effective way of keeping weeds down and i'm always looking for viable alternatives for people to um to discourage them from applying um, weed killer i'm on a mission to stop people applying weed killer and um it was pointed out to me a few months ago my mushroom specialist that mushrooms yeah quite m mushrooms are um a great way to keep weeds down um they're really effective so uh I, it's that's really really uh, gripped my attention right i'm going to hit record and st uh, start with the uh, uh, slightly for, more formal beginning. Um, see if you notice any difference. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> um, oh, it's being recorded anyway. Okay, it was already being recorded. So if you are watching the replay, I didn't realise it was already recording. So you got all that prattling preamble. So anyway, um, thank you very much for um, joining me this evening, for um, giving me some of your precious time. And um, I know some of you know me. Um, for those of you that don't, I am Vivian Campbell and I'm a qualified herbalist. And I qualified 13 years ago. Um, I did a degree in herbal medicine. Not that I particularly wanted to do a degree, but when I was looking to do uh, to become a herbalist, it was so long ago that it was before the days of Google and typing things into the internet and getting back pages and pages and pages of answers. So it actually took me at least 18 months to even find a course. And then off I went and did it. Nowadays, you can do all sorts of um, apprenticeships and all sorts of lovely things, but that was what I did. And... Um, I, so my background is in medicinal herbs, but I, I got into, um, I've been taking guided foraging walks for eight years. And uh, I always laugh and say I've been doing them for so long that the first two years that I advertised a foraging and wild food um, cookery course, um, they didn't run because there weren't any bookings <laughs> to run them. So that's how long ago it was. It, but there was a time when nobody was interested in foraging. I don't know if you can remember that. I can. They're all interested now, which is wonderful. It's um, wonderful to see people um, opening up to um, discovering about nature and their surroundings. You know, when I started working as a herbalist, 
pe people were very, very interested in health, um, but they, they were more interested in buying expensive supplements. That's what they wanted, really. They weren't particularly interested in me saying, you know, that plant there um, is um, rich in vitamin C or anything like that. It, there, there was still that disconnection. And that disconnection seems to be breaking down now, which is great. And it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to re-engage with nature and your surroundings. And um, I really, I, I'm not the world's most advanced experienced forager either. There are just so many plants that are edible. Um, but I, I have a lot of knowledge about the local ones and um, it's it's remarkable the number of plants that you're surrounded by that you either haven't noticed or just treat as an annoying weed that are edible and are delicious. So I hope to introduce you to some of those just now. I have picked um, a little seasonal, oops, seasonal bouquet from my garden. If I put that, oh, this is very, it's very counterintuitive where the camera is when you're doing this. It seems to be backwards. Anyway. There's a little bouquet here and I will go through this with you tonight, some of the edible things that are in here. I also have some um, extracts of edible um, herbs, um, nuts and fruits and berries and things that I collected last year uh, that I've made extracts from and I have some of those to show you too. So um, let's start with something fresh. Um, let's let's start with an obvious one and um, i know we touched on this last night for beginners so can you see this one whoa, whoa. oh it's just so any can anybody oh. so can any guesses as to what that is uh we did look at it last night yeah yeah it is yeah yeah well done it is it's nettle and um, yeah, it's, it's a small bit of nettle. You're right, I've broken off <laughs> a small bit of nettle because my nettles get held back by the snow on uh, Saturday. Um, but nettles are, um, this is the stinging nettle. I don't know if we've got anybody on from the States tonight. Um, I'm just asking because um, the stinging nettle does seem to grow. Sorry, you've got, oh, okay. You've got low, low resolution on the video. Right, okay. Um, so, um, so sorry, the reason I'm asking about the States is um, the States do seem to be a place where there are where nettles, there are, there are large parts of the States where the stinging nettle just doesn't grow. Um, but for those of us in, um, in Britain and, and uh, uh, Ireland and mainland Europe, we're very familiar with this because, of course, we all get, get got stung by it when we were children. Um, the thing with nettle that I mentioned last night is it is it's a natural antihistamine. If you take it regularly and the more nettle you drink, the less reactive you get. So you actually. OK, sorry, I'm just getting a message saying to hold it still. Is that better? Um, so um, the more nettle you drink, the less you actually tend to react to the stings. So I can um, frequently walk amongst nettles and pick them up and things and not actually get stung. Um, although I would, I wouldn't go as far as rolling in nettles. I know some people do that. I, I wouldn't chance that. But um, I, it does. I, I don't get stung the way that I used to. That's for sure. So anyway, nettles um, are a green, a wild green um, that. Um, they're one that people tend to, to come to easily when they're foraging because foraging, of course, is um, it's a lovely, lovely interest to have, but it is a skill and um, there are other things in the hedgerow that are dangerous and are poisonous. So when I'm teaching foraging, particularly when I'm teaching online, I, ha I have an online course where I teach foraging as well as doing classes in Ireland. Um, I stick to things that are very, very easy to recognise that you don't, uh, you, that you wouldn't muddle up um, easily with a poisonous plant. So nettle is a great place to start. And um, in Ireland, um, it's actually traditional here to cook nettle in with the bacon and cabbage. So for those of you who aren't in Ireland, bacon and cabbage is pork <laughs> cooked in a pot or done in the oven. Um, I'm not sure, actually, um, with cabbage. And um, it's a traditional um, 
saying in Ireland as well to have three portions of nettles before May because it's a good spring tonic to clear out your system and it's a traditional way to get it into into people to hide it from your family basically hide the fact that you're you're um, feeding them nettles and cook it in with bacon and cabbage um you can um, cook it in with cabbage you can also cook it in with spinach or you can just cook it on its own as a spring green as an alternative to spinach or cabbage or kale and um, it's really really tasty it does not sting your mouth when it's cooked it will sting your mouth when it's raw and um, I promised to tell you my story about that last night didn't I so my story about nettles is (laughs) Um, I, I, when I was start, starting foraging, um, geez, about, I suppose, 16 or 17 years ago, maybe, I was out with a friend in Lancashire who, um, who, who was great. And, you know, she was pointing out wild marjoram and chickweed and things. And we picked these wild herbs and, um, including nettle. And we went back to her house and she's, and, um, and she'd had a vegetarian restaurant and she was very knowledgeable and she was just the kind of person that you didn't really argue with, you know. <laughs> and she said to me, um, she said, right, we're going to put the nettles in the salad. And she said, and what we're going to do is we're going to bash them with a the rolling pin because it's the hooks. It's the, the hooks that, that grow underneath the leaves that sting you. So if we bash the hooks, then they won't sting our mouth. And um, so, so we, we dutifully rolled them with the rolling pin and it, we mixed it in with the wild marjoram and the chickweed and the fatal error, was, well, it wasn't fatal, but the error we made was um, she made this lovely yogurty dressing and um, which completely masked which herb was which, of course. And I took the first mouthful of it and I said, Jane, you didn't bash the nettle hard enough because my mouth was all stung. So I broke the first rule of foraging, which is, don't try anything until you see somebody else who knows what they're doing. Try it first. So um, as long as you stick to that rule, then you'll be fine. There is a village as well in um, Devon or Dorset, I think, where they have an annual nettle eating competition. I did meet somebody from that village um, a few years ago. She was at a talk I was doing and they, they, they roll up the nettles, they fold them and they chew them and they have a competition to see how many nettles they can eat. Anyway, I don't recommend that you do that. I recommend that you cook them. The other thing you can do is um, just make tea, which is really, really, really easy. And I'm going to show you how to do that if you hang on for a sec. Now, now this is how I recommend you make herbal teas from um, wild herbs. Is get yourself one of these cafe tiers and just use it for herbs. Don't use it for coffee. Otherwise, you're going to end up with herby coffee flavor and that will just be absolutely disgusting and um when you're using nettles you can use you know you can pick a good couple of handfuls of fresh nettles to make tea shove them in this and pour on boiled water and then you can see the herbs floating around in there i've got a blend of dandelion leaves and nettles and plantain and all sorts of things that i picked earlier today and pour on the boiled water and let it stand and you can let it stand from anything from 10 minutes to several hours really this has been standing for several hours which is why it's got such a dark color but it's really 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 rich in nutrients because it's been steeping for so long so it's a great thing to drink so I'll just put that down so I don't spill it on my laptop so um that then brings me on to what's in nettles so nettles are um a really really wonderful mineral mineral rich tonic the tradition uh, you know in traditional medicine they're known as a blood tonic but um and that was long before scientists ever discovered anything about minerals so um now that we know a bit more about chemistry uh, we've looked at nettles and we can see that they're very very rich in iron and of course iron builds up the blood and helps to prevent anemia but they're also very rich in calcium and magnesium so it's it's a great thing to try and treat people with who are um concerned about being deficient in calcium so people it it can be good to help people um who have osteoporosis or are concerned about developing osteoporosis and um it's it's a wonderful example of nature being in balance because 
calcium supplements are only helpful up to a point because we need magnesium to be present as well in order to absorb calcium and if you're buying supplements you need to buy calcium and magne magnesium but nettles contain both so they are a really 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 lovely and um, rich source of um all sorts of minerals really they're fantastic and um there are all sorts of elaborate dishes that you could cook with nettles, but I'm a, I'm a great believer in the simple things because the simple things are the things that you will combine into your lifestyle easily. And they're the things then that will improve your health and will improve your life rather than me showing you something really, really elaborate. I mean, that's great. You know, it can be lovely to make really, really beautiful things, but to just know that you can go out and pick a handful of nettles and wash them and chop them and put them through um, cook them as a side dish on their own or or in spinach is a really really practical tip because you're quite likely to do that and it's the same with the tea um, in the autumn you can also harvest the seeds of nettles and um, they can be used as a wild food too um, so anyway so that is an introduction to the nettle um, does anybody have any nettle recipes that they want to share or um, if you have, remember, you can type things into the chat bar. So if you've got any comments, do work away. I Next, I have oh, knocked these all over the table. So I've got some. Is it safe to take nettle seeds when pregnant? Um, I would avoid nettle seeds when I'm pr in pregnancy just because they're much, much stronger. But nettle generally speaking is a pregnant lady's friend because they're so rich in iron and um, which of course you have to keep up in pregnancy and calcium because if you don't take a calcium supplement in some form then you usually end up losing a tooth because the baby will drag the uh, will drain the stores of calcium from your body you won't the, the baby doesn't go without you go without and um, so nettle leaves um you know the fresh nettles that I showed you there are wonderful in pregnancy they also um help the blood to clot so they're a great thing to take coming up preparing for labor to try and prevent um huge blood loss um, the only time I don't, uh, I recommend that people don't take nettles in pregnancy is um, if they're undergoing fertility treatment and they're on blood thinning medication. Sometimes people have recurrent miscarriages because the blood is clotting and they're given aspirin or drugs similar to aspirin to thin the blood. And it's it's wonderful. I mean, they, they, they usually are able to carry full term and have their child and um, just such a remarkably simple treatment so um that's the only time i don't recommend that you take nettle if you're pregnant because if you're 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 on a drug to thin the blood so you don't want to take something that clots the blood um because it would interfere with that um how do you eat the seeds you can just eat them uh nettle cordial yum 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 yeah quite a nettle beer N i mean nettle beer was um i'm not recommending you go and drink when you're pregnant but if you look back at books from sources from a few hundred years ago then it was nettle beer that was made and given to women when they were pregnant and now from our modern perspective where we don't drink at all in pregnancy because we know about the damage that can be done to the fetus from alcohol that can seem really awful but if you it's important to put yourself back in the time of the people um, that uh, the time that they lived in and uh, they were living in a time where water was a really big source of disease cholera and typhus so alcohol was much safer so um so the um a lot of tonics were in tonic wines tonic beers and things because that was actually a safer way to um take herbs because water carried so much deadly disease basically uh, oh yeah, great in soup and I love to add them to mashed potatoes with wild garlic and spring onions. Makes a great potato cake when fried in olive oil and butter and poached egg on top and a grating of parmesan cheese. Wow. <laughs> Thanks Denise. So yeah, absolutely. They're great recipes and um, my favourite soup with um, nettle is actually combining nettle and wild, wild garlic together. Um, because they tend to be in season at the same time anyway. They both are good blood cleansers and nettle has got quite a gentle taste when it's um, fresh and I think one of the mistakes that people can make when they make nettle soup is they don't put enough other things in it to flavour it. So they're really nice added into a vegetable soup or a chicken soup or something but I love 
doing nettle soup with handfuls of fresh wild garlic leaves as well. And I think they're that's absolutely great together. And I intend to record an e-course lesson about that very soon. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I must try them in potato cakes. Thank you very much indeed. They are great tips, Denise. So, um, nettles. So anyway, right. We can't spend the whole webinar just talking about nettles. Well, I could spend the whole webinar just talking about nettles, but I'd better move on. Um, so, um, Dandelion. Uh, is anybody else having a problem with the video? Um, somebody's having a problem with the video. Um, it could be the broadband where you are or Wi-Fi if you're on Wi-Fi. Um, that sounds you only got to try that occasionally. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I just need a television channel, I think, instead of webinars. <laughs> um, anyway, we'll muddle through. So um, it, it is, we do take technology for granted now, don't we? And we get fr frustrated very quickly when it doesn't work perfectly. But um, we forget how absolutely remarkable it is that we're able to do these things. Um, so anyway, dandelions. So dandelion leaves, when they are fresh, are very, very rich in vitamin C. And um, thank you very much. I'm being told the sound is good. Thank you. So they're very rich in vitamin C, which is wonderful for all sorts of reasons, because dandelions are one of the few plants that we can still harvest in the winter. The trouble with lots of herbs is that they're only available seasonally and very few of them are available in the winter. So we go to all sorts of um, uh effort to make extracts so that we can still take them when when after the plant has died back we can still take the medicine or the food from them however um the dandelion bless him or her gives us its um medicine and its food all year round and um you can just pick fresh dandelions they, they do taste bitter the leaves do taste bitter so you, a nice way to use them is just to pick them and, oh, great, restarting. Yeah, that's it. That's technology. Switch off and switch it back on again. And it usually works. <laughs> um, sorry, just in case you think I'm schizophrenic, I'm just having two different conversations <laughs> all the way through this. Um, anyway, um, so um, 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 chop the dandelion and put it through a salad. Don't make the salad purely from dandelion leaves um, because they're very, very bitter, but add them into a salad because they add a real nice depth of flavour. Um, and um, I'm reliably informed that restaurants in London charge extra. You know, they, they put a, a markup on their salads when there's foraged dandelion leaves in them. Uh, which can seem quite remarkable to us. They're great food for guinea pigs and things as well. I, I know people who go out and get them for their, their guinea pigs. Anyway, um, another nice thing to do with them is just chop them and put them through stir fries or um, put, cook them through an omelette as well. And it's just that nice, sharp, bitter taste. And that helps to digest quite fatty things. So if you've got a heavy cheese omelette, the sharpness of the dandelion uh, really cuts through rather nicely. So um, that is dandelion. And then um, the dandelion flowers um, you'll be very familiar with as well. Again, they have um, a, a bitter flavour, but you can pick the petals off and sprinkle them through pancake batter and make sort of pancakes or fritters with them. And they're really nice. And they just look so pretty with the yellow petals through them and you can also if you don't mind sugar i know sugar is the enemy now but um if you're still willing to use sugar you can make a really really nice syrup from um dandelion flowers so if you're really showing off you can serve your dandelion fritter pancakes with your own dandelion uh, syrup instead of maple syrup and uh, really really get big foraging credits so um, that is uh, dandelion flowers and um, you know we do um, it, you know in this part of the world we do tend to regard dandelion as a weed I mean I just think there are few sites as glorious as the fields and the sides of the roads when they're just golden with dandelions I mean I just think they're absolutely beautiful and it breaks my heart when people go out and put weed killer on them anyway the, bee, the bees love them, but I just think it's just glorious. Um, 
is it just the petals or do you use the leaves? Yeah, you can, no, you can make things from the petals. So we usually put the petals into the, to the sugar to make flour syrups or sprinkle them through the pancake batter. And then the leaves we tend to cook or um, use in salad. Yep. Um, I think that's, uh, was I going to say anything else about dandelion? Can't remember. If I was, it's gone. So um, I have got um, a lovely spring flower for you here. Um, see if that helps. Can you see? Oops. Can you see this one? This is, oh, does anybody know what that is? Yes, it is. Uh, yes, well done. It's primrose. So this is primula vulgaris. So this is the common primrose. It's not evening primrose. Evening primrose is a completely different plant. It's just the common name. Uh, names overlap, but they're not related at all. And um, evening primrose is, is really, really tall. It's taller. Than, I'm very short, though. But it's taller than me and it grows really tall and it's it's got completely different yellow flowers. Anyway, this is a common primrose which is related to cowslips, both of which are edible and you can make um, and you can make lovely um country wines and things from them as well. And um in uh, in Ireland, in um, in the Republic of Ireland, primroses aren't protected. Uh, in the UK and Northern Ireland, uh, the last I knew, they are protected and you're not allowed to pick them from the wild, but you are allowed to pick them in Ireland. They're very, very easy to cultivate, so they're very easy to cultivate in your garden. So I recommend that you plant them. And uh, they do seem to like, um, they like being in the shade, although they, they like being out in full, in full sunshine as well. Um, but I, I, I want to mention them. I do mention... Um, plants that have become rare deliberately because what strikes me when I look at the old or the not even so old sources about them is the vast quantities that people used to use them in. I mean the recipes for making primrose or cowslip wine call for jugs full of the blossoms and cowslip blossoms are small. You know these ones are quite big but cowslip blossoms are small and um, it just shows me um, it's really striking to me the damage that has been done to our environment in such a short space of time. And rather than say, oh, don't go and pick these, I actually like to highlight that they're edible and how many things they were used for, because it's a really big lesson in damage to the environment and conservation and, and to encourage people to bring them back again, you know, because all it takes is... It's like a lot of things in life. If you smoke, all you need to do is stop. And, and uh, all it takes is for people to stop damaging things, to stop bulldozing hedgerows and um, start to encourage, the, you know, encourage them again. And um, because nature just flourishes. It, it, it's, I was teaching a class last year and, um, and somebody said to me, oh, there's so much of it, isn't there? And I said, yeah, it's so abundant. And this is it trashed. You know, this is us living in a world that does not <laughs> appreciate nature. We've not built our lives around it. And yet it's still there. And Mother Nature just gives and gives and gives. And um, it doesn't matter how much we, uh, uh, not, not us personally, obviously, because we are on this webinar, but um uh, you know human beings in general um have have abused um the environment and yet it's still there and it's everywhere and uh, they're in towns and cities don't think you need to be living out in some sort of beautiful um part of the countryside to find wild plants that are edible and medicinal you don't and i started um foraging when i trained to be a herbalist i lived in a really really grotty place it was a really grotty <laughs> grotty town that got city status while I was there and it was you know it was pretty grim and um, I was able to find all sorts of things there you can go along disused railways and um, near rivers and canals you'd just be astonished what you can find and then yeah absolutely I um, always mention these things because I want to encourage people to plant these things in their garden and um, yeah exactly that's that's what I was saying is um you know to don't decimate the wild populations and um, bring them you know I, I encourage you to um plant them in your garden because they're very very easy to um grow and they're so pretty so anyway coming on to how um you can actually use um primroses 
um, you can put them into salads, the, the blossoms, and they can be crystallised. That's an old fashioned thing. Um, and for those of you in Ireland, famous Bally Malou uh, restaurant and cookery school, home of Darina Allen and Rachel Allen and Myrtle Allen, of course, who founded it. Um, they crystallise their own primroses there that they cultivate in their garden. They have got acres and acres and acres of organic garden down at their restaurant and cookery school in East Cork. If you haven't been, I highly recommend that you go. It's beautiful. And they serve the crystallised primroses um, on their cakes and desserts there. Um, I have a lovely recipe that I'm going to try out this um, spring for um, pickled primroses. I don't really have a sweet tooth, so I will crystallise them because I know people want to learn that. But um, I don't really have a sweet tooth. I'm more into pickles and savoury things. So I'm going to have a go at pickling them from my garden. Don't worry, it's one from my garden. They were covered in snow on Saturday. There's a picture on my Facebook page of my my uh, snowed, rather than frosted primroses, my snowed on primroses. Um, so that's um, the primrose. And um, there's a lovely book um uh, the Irish sort of classic book on foraging, our equivalent of um, Food for Free by Richard Maybe is Wild and Free by um, Kit and Cyril O'Kiron and um, O'Kiron, sorry. And um, it was, they, they researched that in the 1970s and published it in 1978 and it's been reprinted. And so I actually know Kit. Kit lives very near me and um, she's lovely. And um, she said to me, you know, it was regarded as such an eccentric hobby back then. And people were sort of saying, so why are you collecting the berries? Can you not afford to buy jam from the supermarket? And she can't quite believe there's this whole renaissance in foraged foods now and their books back in print after nearly 40 years. Um, but um, she said to me, you know, that, um, uh, yeah, her recipes, there are recipes in her books for the primrose and the cowslip wine, and it is jugs of flowers, so that is not that long ago. I'm not talking about recipes that from the 1600s. I'm talking about recipes that were used, you know, 35 years ago, and um, we can't do that anymore from the wild. It really is staggering. Um, but Kit said to me... Um, that you know they would go out and they would they would harvest all sorts of different berries and they'd go back then the next year for the rose hips and the hedgerows had been the hedgerows had been bulldozed so um wherever they got their crab apples or their rose hips from the year be the years before so it's just um it's really important to um start to open people's eyes to what's there because people when they're bulldozing things like that they're obviously not seeing food and medicine and if you go because you don't you wouldn't bulldoze them then there um you know people were doing that because of different farming grants for having fields and acreage and things but if you were using if you saw your hedgerow as your treasure chest of medicine and food then you wouldn't do that so um so speaking of which i've got some things from the autumn um left that i wanted to show you so i have here um a dish of um, hazelnuts. So these are, sorry, I need a third hand for doing this really. These are hazelnuts uh, that I harvested uh, last autumn because I live um, on the edge of the Burren in County Clare and the Burren is um, a national park that has all sorts of rare flowers and plants from all over the world that are alpine flowers and that are middle eastern orchids um, but it's covered in hazel so there's loads and loads of hazelnuts and um so hazel is a lovely thing to do to go out and harvest and bash open the nuts with a hammer and there's not an adult or a child in the world that doesn't enjoy that job it's just great and um and uh, it's lovely then to make your own pesto. So I made a lovely pesto with the hazelnuts and um, this plant here, which is back in season now. It tends to be available from April right through until September or October, really. So this is any guesses as to which leave this is? Any guesses? This is um, sorrel. So you might have heard of sorrel if you don't recognise it. Yeah, well, it's, it's not, um, it's common sorrel rather than sheep sorrel. Yeah, but it, it's common sorrel, yeah. And um, so it's, oops, 
it's a type of rumex and um if you taste it mm, it's really really lemony and fresh and sharp and it's absolutely delicious and um, so it can go into a pesto with um if you're you know being a foraging purist with hazelnuts that you've harvested yourself or with nuts that you've bought from the supermarket and it's really really sharp and zingy it also it's remarkably it's very very easy to pick it's very easy to pick large amounts of sorrel some forage foods are really really hard work <laughs> you're out digging roots for ages out of clay soil and it's really really tough going where sorrel is plentiful it's abundant and it's really easy to pick um so you can actually rustle up a meal from sorrel very quickly and um one of the nicest things to do with this is just make sorrel sauce where you just cook it in a tiny bit of water a bit like you would spinach and it shrinks right down and then puts salt and pepper and butter through it and it's gorgeous it's so sharp and lemony it's just absolutely beautiful does anybody do anything with sorrel is this a plant that you're familiar with um where is it typically found that's a good question thank you it seems to be found um uh in most places really it's it's um it grows in open fields and gardens so it grows in full sunshine but you'll also get sorrel growing in the shade and what i recommend for beginners <clears throat> that they do is that they make sure they pick sorrel from out in the open from the sunshine because in early spring there's another plant that uh, called lords and ladies that um is poisonous and um to the to the untrained eye if you're not familiar with the two plants then you can muddle them up um but lords and ladies only grows in the shade whereas sorrel grows in the shade but it also grows out in the sun as well so it's a really good tip to um to pick it from an open field um can you make nettle pesto or will it sting i th yeah, I think that depends how good, how well you pulverize it, how good your food processor is. I haven't tried that. <laughs> I don't, I don't want it on a super fast setting. <laughs> Has anybody else made nettle pesto? <laughs> and have you lived to tell the tale? <laughs> or have you been able to speak afterward? <laughs> um, yeah, you love lords and ladies that was your first foraging mistake not good oh jeepers did you eat it i mean you don't you tend not to um i don't think anybody's ever died of eating lords and ladies instead of sorrel because i've been reliably informed that lords and ladies um sting burn the mouth so you're not going to eat loads of it by accident i think people spit it out pretty quickly um if you blitz the nettle to the consistency of chopped parsley in a food processor oh great so it is okay so you do the answer is on your you need a really good food processor uh yeah yeah um so that's great but yeah lords and ladies is an easy one to, to muddle up so just make sure you pick it out from the open because um lords and ladies only grows in the shade and um and my other tip for beginners is um oh so as uh, I've just had another Lords and Ladies story. Lords and Ladies, I swallowed the juice when I was 15 and lay horizontal for six hours. So I reckon a larger amount would hospitalise you. Yeah, I mean, it is it is deadly. I, it's just it's quite rare that people ever take enough of it to kill themselves because it causes this burning sensation. That's what I've read about it. Whereas other very poisonous plants taste quite innocuous and even smell nice. So people tend to uh, you know the tragic accidents tend to come from them rather than lords and ladies how did you manage to swallow the juice we'll need to talk about that afterwards i want to hear that whole like chewing glass geez you must have been determined robin to do that <laughs> well, I, do, I do know a child to eat a glass vase oh geez i'm getting completely off the topic right okay so anyway um <laughs> So um I so good another good foraging tip that I have for beginners is wait don't forage in the spring because young leaves it's really really easy to muddle up young leaves and um a classic example of leaves that look really similar in April 
but look completely different when the plant is fully grown later in the year are um, young comfrey leaves uh, which are edible and medicinal and young foxglove leaves which are deadly and um, I have got I've got a story about that actually which I wouldn't tell you just now because it's getting late but um, but my tip is when you're beginning foraging and this is the way I teach beginners is is to wait until later in the year it's good to observe things because the same plants will quite often come back up year after year in the same spot and so if you've seen it flowering in the summer and you know it's comfrey rather than foxglove then you know when you see the leaves in april you know which plant it's likely to be and it's the same then for the lords and ladies and the sorrel i've actually got lords and ladies and sorrel growing right next to each other in my back garden in the shade um, but, but I know which is which, um, even in early spring, um, whereas the sorrel send out in the open bits of the garden too. But that is my tip is wait until you see it, the plant gain its really distinctive features. So wait until it flowers and then you can be certain that you've got the right plant. Um, so, um, yeah, so, yeah, there's all sorts of really good comments actually going on here. Um, tips and things. So, um, look, I hope that's been um, interesting for you. It's only a, a little introductory thing, but remember that when you're well food foraging as well, it's, it's good on so many levels because it encourages us to look after our environment and protect our environment. And it means that you're out getting exercise and it means that you're cutting down on food miles and it means that your food is much, much richer in vitamins and minerals than this stuff that we buy from the supermarket that's shipped from the other side of the world that's been you know hasn't ripened properly has been sitting in cold storage and all of these awful things um so um you really are um it you know it's good for you it's it, it's because you're exercising you're getting fresh air you're connecting with nature you're valuing your environment and protecting it and uh, you're benefiting nutritionally as well so it's a wonderful wonderful thing to do um, there are lots of people in lots of different places teaching foraging. I teach in Ireland, but I also teach online via my online course, which is an introduction. It's called Learn With The Seasons, and it's an introduction to local plants that are easy to identify. I have got a 100% record of none of my students dying from having eaten their own plant. And that is a record um, that I intend to maintain. Um, so um, it's, um, it's great because it's packed full of videos to help you identify the plants and show you how to extract them as medicines or cook them and use them as wild foods. Um, if you're interested in this, I am. Uh, I'll drop that into the message bar actually, but I will email you round. Um, uh, I will email you round um, a special offer if you want to book it in the next forty-eight hours, and I'll give you twenty percent off. And I'm been busy beavering away. That um, I launched the course last year, and um, and um, have got. Um, lots of students enrolled from last year and I'm busy um, I'm busy adding even more new features into the e-courses this year which I am super duper excited about there are actually already over 100 videos there that I filmed last year but I'm planning to add in some more this year and also to have some special guest experts uh, featuring on the course too which I for one am super duper excited about because um it's going to be um, wonderful to work with other experts, um, with other, um, uh, not that, I don't know, I'm not calling myself an expert, but um, to work with other people, it's just great, uh, and share our knowledge and our enthusiasm. So I've popped that into the chat bar, that's the link to the online courses if you want to have a look at them, that is the coupon, oh hang on a minute, that's not right, that's not going in properly, uh, I'll post the coupon code again. Um, and um, I'll, I'll email you around the details as well. And um, remember that the recording of this webinar and yesterday's webinar, if you want the recording of the Herbal Medicine webinar, then just let me know and I will send that round to you tomorrow morning. It, they, they process overnight. It takes a few hours for the recordings to process. So listen, um, thank you ever so much. I didn't even show you. Here's, that's a delicious honey 
made from honeysuckle flowers. Oh, it's exquisite. So that's July, August, you get to make things like that. I've um, got some rosehip vinegar Ooh, here. Absolutely beautiful stuff. The hedgerows are bursting with these things. Let's get back working with nature. It's wonderful to see people interested. Thank you very, 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 very much for your time uh, and your attention and being with me this evening and for all your wonderful comments and questions and scary stories. <laughs> I really appreciate you being with me and thanks very much and um, cheerio. <laughs>